Our next interview is with Jack Fries of Tambourine Books. And uh, Jack, just give us a little general background on yourself, where you were born, where you grew up, uh, colleges, high schools, family, how you got started in the trade. Uh, bring, us up, bring us up a little bit up to speed on you. Okay. Well, I was born in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area. And uh, uh, my father, my parents were both great readers. So I actually probably read fairly well before I got to school. And my dad um, was a very persnickety guy. He was a writer. He was an advertising writer. Wanted to write the great American novel. Never happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a very gentle guy and devoted to books, not in an obsessive sort of way. And he was not a collector, but he was an accumulator. And he had kept all his boys' books, all his, his uh, Tom Swift books and G.A. Henty were all on the top shelf of this little library in the house that I grew up in. And my brothers and I were not allowed to touch them. He would read them to us, but we weren't allowed to touch them. And one day he called me with, a book that I wasn't supposed to have in my room. And uh, I was taken to task for that. So I, I got really annoyed, and, and I thought, you know, well, I'm just going to go get my own books. <laughs> so as a kid, I went to all the usual venues, the church bazaars and the flea markets and the tailgate sales and whatever was going on in the 50s at that point, and started buying books. So, you know, I, I had this love affair with books, mostly to read or to look at things that I liked. And my... Uh, my profession for a long time while I was selling books was that of a, an artist. Um, I was a painter and an illustrator and I made my living doing, uh, doing that for a long time. So my educational background was in the fine arts and I, I went to what is now the University of the Arts in Philadelphia but my degree came from the University of Pennsylvania because they didn't grant degrees at that time. So. Uh, that was my undergraduate work, and then I went and got a graduate degree in fine arts and a graduate degree in art history, and I taught both fine arts and art history for some time. So the visual was the theme in my, um, in my quest for things that I, that I like to look at, uh, books, prints, ephemeral things. Uh, so it was this kind of love of the printed page, the printed picture, uh, the printed image, and uh, so by the time I was in graduate school, I was married, and I think we had one child and one on the way. And I was buying pretty expensive books. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, let me back up. When I was an undergraduate, I, was, I made friend, uh, friends with uh, Mabel Zahn, the, uh, the Grand Dame at Sessler's in Philadelphia. Absolutely. And <clears throat> she was very kind to me. She didn't like everybody, but she was very sweet to me. And at that time, I was buying 20th century illustrated books, Arthur Rackham and Dulac and things like that. And, and she would let me pay one time for, say, a limited signed Arthur Rackham. Uh, so I bought a few. I didn't buy a lot. And at that time, they were anywhere from 60 to $200. You know, maybe some were a little bit more. And I had a nice little group of those and a bunch of trade editions. And... But by the time I was in graduate school, I'd moved on to color plate books. And I remember the day we settled on our, uh, on our house, and we had, like, no money. I couldn't buy a garden hose. And I, <laughs> I, and I had bought a $2,000 book that day, which in those days was something. A lot of money. So I, I was constantly having to pay for my sins. And the way I paid for those sins for my collection was to run around to all these venues that I had found things at, little antique shows and junk shops and, and other booksellers. And, and at that time, by that time, I had acquired enough knowledge that I could, uh, I knew that, that something was more valuable than what had been priced, particularly in another bookseller's. Uh, and uh, I would buy it and sell it to the person or trade it for, the, for credit for the things that I had bought for myself. And by 1970, my accountant and my art business said, you're making too many transactions to be a collector. Why don't you become a dealer? Get a tax number, get a letterhead, get a card. So I did, and that's that was the beginning of my uh, of my career as a bookseller. Was it in, Phil in the Philadelphia area? Yeah, I live in Haverford. I've lived there my entire life. Um, the um, 
we, we opened a shop in the mid-70s in Bryn Mawr. And what I really wanted out of that shop, besides, to meet, besides meeting uh, new customers, was the opportunity to buy books because the Philadelphia suburbs are wealthy suburbs where I live. And there were a lot, of, and still are, a lot of uh, libraries that haven't been touched for hundreds of years, literally. Wow. So, you know, Philadelphia was, a, was the center of the culture in America in the 18th century, second largest city in the, in the world next to London. And uh, the printing history in Philadelphia is extensive, starting way back with Mr. Franklin and before. So, there's lots and lots of stuff, lots of historical material, lots of wealthy families that went on the grand tour early on in the 19th century and brought back things and and because of the wealth, uh, there were just a lot of libraries. You know, people bought houses and they bought carriages and they bought clothes and they filled a library up in the 19th century. So the whole of the main line is largely 19th century in uh, development. And there's still still a lot of great libraries extent in that part of the world. I remember the day that Leary's closed. Oh, I went to Leary's at least once a week when I was in college, yeah. I think I used to go there, well, from Boston area, I would go once a month and go to McManus and go to Leary's and go to Cecil's and in the old days when they were open bookshops. Oh, absolutely. The cute little story, my, my um, father went to the University of Pennsylvania, as did his two brothers, and in the middle of the, in the height of the Depression, and my grandfather lost his job. He was an architect for the Pennsylvania Railroad, and they weren't building anything. He designed, wasn't, he was not a cutting edge architect. He designed outbuildings and sheds and <laughs> stuff like that. Essentials. But he lost his job, and the boys had to stop college. So uh, he also, my grandfather had a small library, and he was a reader, as everybody in the family was. They didn't have any money, but education and reading were important to them. And he had to sell his books. And I I'm still on the quest. I find books with my grandfather's book plate, and he sold them to Leary's because most of them I find have the Leary's markings in them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been trying to, I can't reconstruct it because I have no idea what was in there. It happened before I was born, but, but I do find my grandfather's books around, and they're, they're not rare books, but they're interesting books. It was, it was a great bookshop. Fabulous. And as was Louder Milks in Washington. Didn't know them. Yeah. It was on the same hill. Yeah. Anyway, Jack, um, let's see. What are some of your fondest recollections of the, are your early days in the trade? Were there booksellers who were friends and mentors for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the, 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 you know, the, the great business in Philadelphia and still exists in the Philadelphia area is McManus. And, Clarence Wolf and I are relatively the same age, and he was brand new when I first, when I used to go into McManus before Clarence got there, yeah. uh, to see his father, who I knew from, he taught at the same university that I, that I went to and eventually taught at. And we got to know each other, and he was, as we all know, those who know Mr. Wolf, a, a very sharp and, and uh, bright guy, and he was doing it full time, I was doing it part time uh, at best. And so I kind of latched on to Clarence, and, and then he introduced me to people, and, you know, I met people like Sam Murray, and uh, there were Sam Murrays in my part of the world that dealt in graphic ephemera, which is stuff I've always loved, and uh, uh, a lot of people. But uh, Clarence was the first contact that I had with the legitimate uh, uh, book community. And, uh, you know, I used to go to auctions with him in New York, and, and uh, I went to book fairs at the plaza before I was a member of the ABAA and helped him out. And uh, th They were the real, you know, learning grounds for me at that time. But, you know, mostly it was just going to lots and lots of bookshops, yeah. going Constantly. where books were and looking at lots of books, looking at lots of books. You know, there, I had a, a, a man who's a good friend, uh, who's a retired college professor who somewhere toward the end of his career, he had always been a book collector, kind of a small-time dealer, wanted to be a full-time dealer, and threw himself into it at, at a you know, relatively late stage in life. And brilliant guy, and good nose for books, but he just hadn't looked at enough books. 
to make it go. You know, he just hadn't seen enough. And, uh, and I think it was the looking and the curiosity that, that was the best for me. Talk a little bit about the internet and you. Uh, was, it, was it a transition that was difficult for you? Uh, what portion of your inventory do you have on the mm -hmm. internet? Mm -hmm. Do you buy on the internet? Mm -hmm. And just, just give us a little capsule of Tamerlane books vis-a-vis yeah, the internet. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I, I was sort of personally resistant to, uh, uh, not the internet, just the whole computer technology business until, it's, a, it's probably about a dozen years ago that I thought, well, you can't fight this. That it's, um, yeah. it's bigger than all of us. It's bigger than all of us. And I kept hearing how, how people were making significant sales and purchases on the Internet. So we ramped up. I hired someone. Uh, uh, the best thing that ever happened in my business, I hired a woman who actually is an MBA, and she, after having three kids, had stopped her career uh, to stay at home, but she needed a little part-time thing, and I was introduced to her, and she knew nothing about the book business, uh, but she was very computer savvy, and she has not only learned the book business, she started her own book business and works for me full-time, and she has a little side business, which is all online. So we, we got up, you know, eventually, and uh, it's a significant part of my business now. We have a nice website, I do very little through the website, mostly all of it's on the major search engines, ILAB site and ABE and whatever else she's got us hooked up to. Uh, we buy a little bit, I'm not, uh, I've become a, a serious fan of eBay to buy, only because I had some luck when I first started doing it, buying some things, and continue to but it takes some time to surf through all the various yeah, it's described very items and you know, stuff that isn't right. And, but it, uh, for somebody that's, that's at my stage in the business, it's, it's kind of fun. You know? I don't run around as much as I used to. Uh, I can do all my auction viewing online right. and bid online or right. by phone uh, or very often I go to the sales, but uh, not like I used to. Yeah. So the, the internet's become a huge part of my life. I think every bookseller's life. Yeah. It's also connected the bookselling community like it's never been connected before. Yeah, I heard you talking to Bob earlier, and uh, he's been at the forefront of that, right. that interrelatedness in our business. And I did, uh, I've only been to one Congress, but the Congress I went to, which was I think in 2000 in it's Edinburgh. Scotland. Well, we were sitting together when they brought that, the pig in or whatever it was that they had, the hangers. <laughs> you remember, remember that? Yeah, what, what, what did they bring? The stuff, was it a... St it was some kind of haggis or something. Oh, the haggis, national, haggis. National well, I'm a Scot. I mean, you know, that's like, you know, that's like bacon and eggs to me. I, I know. And I, I still remember coming out of that castle and listening to the, to the pipe bands and the, and the rain sort of drizzling There wasn't down. a dry eye in that crowd. Right, it was, it was that just... That was one of my most memorable experiences right, in the I, business. I, I'll never forget that. I thought uh, we were finished. You know, I thought the evening was over, we're going to get on the right, bus. And, and we're standing there, and, this, and all of a sudden, out of the mist, comes this pipe band. Yeah, it was And just the guy next to me starts weeping in control of me, and then I started. I just, it was one of those emotional moments... That, wasn't it? ...that an ILAB conference... Often has. Yeah, yeah. Well, moving right along, um, a lot of things have changed in the book business since both of us started, mainly because of, of the internet, etc. Um, you talked a little bit about your your business and computer experience. Well, let me hear a little bit about what you would advise if some young bookseller, etc., came to you and said, "Jack, I'm thinking about becoming a bookseller." Mm. Um, what, what kind of advice w would you would you give them? Have a lot of money uh, <laughs> to start with. It's always helpful. Yeah, it's very helpful. I, I'm not sure what I, I'm not sure my advice would be be sharp enough for a young startup person. Um, I do know what what I see young people bring to the book table, if if you will. Um, it, it's a fresh eye. It's stuff that they care about. There are now uh, at least one of my friend's uh, sons has entered the business. 
and he has a totally different take on it than his than his father father does. Um, I think it's developed a, a, an area of interest in, with with some intensity and insight that that is, is not happening at the moment in the in the trade. I think you know all of us now are paying more attention to to manuscript material to original drawings and, and, and you know the rarer the better upscale uh, stuff yeah to to unique things it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive but I think there has to be a niche where somebody carves out uh, an area that they, they really care about the old traditional stuff that we cut our teeth on certainly doesn't work anymore um, I, I don't know I, I, I think my advice would be useful over a period of time. I, I'd, I'd want to see that person start to develop something and then maybe try to guide them and push them with the knowledge that I have that they might not have. Um, the question always comes up in these discussions as to the future of the ABAA, <clears throat> the future of the ILAB. Um, they keep on telling us that our generation, once our generation leaves the trade, either through retirement or death, there isn't going to be anybody to take it up. Our membership is dwindling each year. We're less and less new members coming in. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I'm, I'm very proud to be a member of both the ABAA and the ILAB, and, and maybe it's wishful thinking. I don't think that our passion, our business, is going to uh, stop. I think it will continue. I think the organizations will continue. I think they're going to take a different form, um, and they're going to have to rock and roll with the times. The, uh, I mean, the book community, the, the, the rare book community worldwide, right now, if you look in this room that we're next to, adjacent yeah, to, it's amazing. unbelievable. It's amazing. I mean, it's a rich, big, full world with seemingly room for, for every kind of, uh, from every period, and taste, and from modest things to things that you would only see in museums other than, uh, you know, a book fair like this. I, 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 don't, I don't have any direct answer to what the future of the organization. I tie it to the future of, of, the, of the world of books, and I think that is alive and well at the moment and will continue. Uh, who do you see as uh, the sort of icons of the trade? Uh, in this day and age. We're here in the year 2009, it's April, we're at a book fair. Uh, who are the, in your opinion, are the icons? The people that I look, you mean in that? Not necessarily in the room, but in the trade and as, as a trade. I mean, you, well, there's so many legends, most of whom are not with us anymore, that I look to as, you know, my forebearers in this yeah. business. Um, but if I look around that room, I mean, there's, there's the great dealers in the world, per, not all, but Many of them were there. I said to uh, Rudolf Chaminel when he was setting up, uh, he's sort of adjacent to where I am. Yeah. I walked over and I said, Rudy, uh, did you bring these books to purposely embarrass the rest of us? <laughs> he wasn't sure I was kidding, but I mean, the Chaminel, Forum, uh, Sorge, uh, the great... Uh, Continental dealers that I don't see other than at book fairs, and the bring, things they bring are just stunning. But there are great American dealers here, and they're, they're, there's just exciting stuff. I mean, in every booth, there's something that, that will draw me in, and and uh, and then largely it's stuff that I don't get to see other than at the New York Fair, or the Boston Fair, or one of the international fairs. Uh, I see lots of my colleagues here. I see their material all the time, or if I visit them, I do. I don't know, it's just, a, but there, there, there's some legendary dealers next door, and, and it's, it's just great to see their stuff. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great book fair, but if you're a young book uh, collector who's just starting out as a collector, mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to get your feet wet at this level. Well, I think, I see, you know, I see the catalog collectors in there. That's a yeah. smart thing for people who visit this to do, and, and particularly young collectors. I mean, just talk to people, ask questions, pick up the catalogs, and read the catalogs. Um, That's how you learn. And you do, and at some point, you'll dive in and buy something. Maybe it's something that you'll regret buying down the line, but I think, you know, with the quality of dealers from top to bottom in the show, uh, 
there, there are things to be had at modest prices that'll, that'll stick. Before I let you go, I just want your opinion about uh, the, a four-day book fair uh, as we have in New York versus every other book fair that's three days. Mm -hmm. Do you find this more challenging, more expensive, more necessary? I think New York is necessary. I'm sure there are a lot of people in there that would disagree with me. People say drop Sunday, Sunday's a dead day. I've done business on Sunday, and I've done this fair for, I don't know, 20-some years. Uh, I've done business on Sundays, not always, but sometimes I do my best business on Sundays. I think New York is a unique book fair in the, in the world of book fairs. I do the Boston show, I don't do the West Coast. Um, I think the three days are, are fine for Boston, yeah, I think but it's I enough. think this is a big enough deal that, you know, getting in and setting up, and I do significant business during setup day, and Thursday you have all day until the, uh, until the special opening. I like it four days. And I do a lot of regional fairs that are only one day. I prefer at least an opening night and the second day mm -hmm. to give it a little bit more formality, if nothing Some else. Some continuity to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Thanks a lot, Jack. You're Thanks, Michael. Your You're view. really it's good a, to do this. this and I, 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 hope the, I hope that more people feel like you do about the training. Yeah, well, I love it. Okay. We'll catch you later. All Thank right, you. buddy.